Well, this final greetings section of Paul's uh, letter here, it, it kind of does read a little bit like, as, as you get to the end of it there, like an, a, an obligatory nog nod uh, to his co-workers and, and, the, and the readers. Uh, but to dis- dismiss it as just that, to dismiss it as just something Paul's going through, the formalities, would, would be to miss how deeply Paul is actually celebrating uh, the work and the realities and the power of the gospel uh, in the lives of the people who, who this gospel has come to, how it turns ordinary people uh, into people who are now shaped by Jesus and now who join Jesus in, in shaping others and in shaping eternity, how it takes the powerful and it, and, and it, and it uses them to lift up the powerless, how it gives a quality to the powerless and, and tells them not to be shaped by the, the, you know, the social perceptions of the world that they may have, but to be shaped by how God views them in Jesus and that they too have a place at the table. These last greetings are a picture of how the gospel gives second chances to people. You, you see Mark, who's, who's Barnabas's cousin, like he, he's back into the table after letting, letting Paul down. And Paul's like, hey, don't, don't be shaped by his history. Here he comes again. That failure in the life of the Christian is not final because Jesus doesn't leave people on the side of the road. Picks them up and gets them rolling again. And, and where to be people like that. The list of people is not just a nod to these people to please and, and do the political correct thing like we do at weddings where we thank Edna for the cake that she made, even if it's no good. You know, thanks Edna for the cake. It's a living picture of what the gospel does in the lives of people. It brings them into God's story. It shapes them to live out his design for his glory and then for their joy. Ordinary people doing eternal things in which Jesus is seen and celebrated, as we've been saying. This is a list of people from all walks of life, if you noticed. Slaves, free, Jews, Gentiles, doctors, posties, men and women. They're they're all in this list. It means that there is no one in any room, in this room, as people would have listened, they would have realized that there's no one uh, who God hasn't got renewed purposes for who God can't transform in Christ. All of your abilities, all of your attributes, all of your skills, gifts, and all these things are are repurposed and transformed and empowered by the Holy Spirit to, to put it as Paul says, uh, you know, that we will be made into co-workers, co-laborers, empowered by the Spirit for the kingdom of God, doing something greater than our ordinary lives. So there's no such thing, or there should be no such thing as a bored and aimless Christian. You could be the most insignificant person in the eyes of culture, in the eyes of the world. But in God's economy, in this, with this renewed purpose in Christ, you are deeply and profoundly significant. Uh, you, you are seen as, as firstborn, uh, heirs to everything that God has in store for you. Like that's now how... You are to be. You've been qualified to share and to serve in the kingdom of God. And as good as all that is, and with all that in mind, like that's the end, we're kind of flipping it over. What I want to focus on today is Paul's imperative, like it's imperative. There's 30 imperatives in this book, and this is, this is one, and that is to be devoted in prayer. As Paul draws his letter to a close, uh, uh, Mark M- uh, Manel in his commentary He calls it a breathtaking cosmic voyage, the book of Colossians, because it covers things, uh, everything from Christ's eternal identity, his supremacy, his sufficiency in in all of creation, in all of redemption, his global mission that his gospel is on in, in recreating a new humanity, in transforming people. Then he, then he drills down into how that works itself out into our lives uh, and, and how it sees the, the ethics of Christ lived out in us, that we die to the power of sin. We're putting off these things and we're putting on new things. We're putting on the ethics, the characteristics, the qualities of Christ and how that reshapes relationships where people use their roles and their positions to display the work of Christ in them and not merely just to get what they want out of life. And it's a big picture and it's a grand tapestry, the lordship of Jesus in the life of a Christian and how that grows up in that and how we grow up in that, 
in that union with Jesus and how our lives are animated and, and transformed by his power. But now Paul turns the attention of the listeners to the relational resource of these people, of this new humanity, of, of these people in the kingdom of God, prayer. It's an incredible privilege of our union with Christ. It means that we have, we have the ear and the heart of God to pour our lives into, to pour out our, everything about ourselves, and to be shaped then by God's voice back to us. As we read scripture, as the Holy Spirit works in us, and we get to come to God with that, as the writer of Hebrews says there in 4.16, we approach the throne of grace with confidence. We don't come crawling in. We can speak with the God of the universe as a loving father. As Tim Keller says, the only person who dare wakes up a king at 3 a.m. in the morning for a glass of water is a child. And we have that kind of access. We have that kind of access to God. So to fail to pray is not to break some arbitrary set of rules and regulations. To fail to pray is to fail to treat God as God has made himself known to us through Jesus. When we pray, yes, we acknowledge that God is sovereign and we acknowledge his goodness and his supremacy and his sufficiency of his son. And, the, and we also acknowledge the absolute need and dependency of ourselves. Tim Keller in his book, Experiencing Awe and Intimacy with God, observes that prayer is this continuing conversation that God started through his word, that God started with his grace as it came into our lives, which eventually becomes a full encounter with him. So prayer is something that you, you practice. Prayer has a, has a beginning and, and, then it, and then it grows and it develops and, and on it goes. You develop this prayer. Conversation with God leads to encounter with God. Prayer turns theology and doctrine into experience. Through it, we sense his presence. We receive his joy. We understand his love, his peace, and his confidence. And thereby, we are transformed. We are changed in attitude and behavior and character. And Paul knows that. Paul knows that prayer is where the Holy Spirit enlivens our heart to God's heart. That's why he finishes with this imperative. Everything that's gone before us now, let's, let's be devoted in prayer. That's got to be the rhythm of our lives. Now, if you've been in church for five minutes, if you've spent any amount of time reading the Bible with, with some sort of consistency, you will have heard this, you will have read this, uh, you will know about this, you will know about the importance of prayer. And yet for some of us, we are quite bad at it. We know we should, but lots of us, and I've lived in this space and come in and out of it all the time, find it hard work to be devoted to prayer. That's because prayer takes effort, grace-driven effort. It's developed in a response to the grace of God in our lives. Prayer is not magic. Paul and the Bible are very realistic about this prayer. It's, it's not some set and forget program, some kind of app that the Holy Spirit downloaded into your life at your conversion. Nor do Christians drift towards prayer. Don Carson says people don't drift towards holiness apart from grace-driven effort. People don't gravitate towards godliness, prayer, Obedience to the scriptures, faith, delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise and we call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and we call it freedom. We drift, drift towards superstition. We call it faith. We cherish indis indiscipline uh, of the loss of self-control and we call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness. We just kind of slide there and delude ourselves into thinking that we have escaped legalism we slide towards godliness and convince ourselves that we have been liberated. You don't just drift towards a prayer life. Prayer is activity. Prayer is in response to uh, experienced grace. And it takes that grace-driven effort. It takes planning. It needs time. It needs space. It needs a place. It needs content. It's hard to pray if you don't actually read your Bible. Like, who are you praying to? What are you putting into your prayers? 
Paul, who wrote this letter, admits prayer is work. Like he starts off the letter, he lets the Colossians know that he has been working in prayer for them. He has not ceased in prayer. The, the way it's written is like he has been at prayer laboring away for these Colossians. And then, and then at the end of it, in this passage, in, in, in this chapter in verses 12, he says that Epaphras always is always struggling on your behalf in his prayers for you. He's at work in prayer. It's not just magical stuff that happens. There's a recognition prayer is not as natural as we sometimes imagine it to be. But a prayerless Christian is an oxymoron. So Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Pray for us, too, that God may open doors for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in change, chains. Pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. It's a pretty straightforward imperative, isn't it? Like prayer is to be a regular expression of your faith. You are to cultivate it. You are to be devoted to it. You are to cultivate a, a persistent prayer life. If you look up our church values, we say that you are to be fervent in prayer. We're, we're, we're fervently prayerful. And this is not so much about intensity of prayer. But it is rather, it's about that prayer should be a standard feature of our lives. We should pray habitually and we should pray with perseverance. There, there should be a devotion to prayer, a dedication, an ongoing rhythm in our lives. Day in, day out. Prayer should be happening. And then Paul gives some modifiers to this devoted uh, to this imperative work of prayer by elaborating out the manner in which this prayer takes place. He says, firstly, it's a way of being watchful um, over the Christian lives. Paul is saying that prayer should keep you alert. Prayer should keep you awake, which is kind of like a bit of an irony because most of us fall asleep when we pray. But Paul is saying um, that prayer keeps you awake and alert spiritually. And, and, and in Paul's words here, there's a bit of an allusion back, a connection back to the Garden of Gethsemane, Mark 14, where Jesus asks his disciples to watch, to be alert, to stay attentive, to pray that they may not fall into temptation. Prayer is a way of avoiding the drift into spiritual lethargy, lethargy and laziness. A vigilant prayer life provides spiritual fortitude the relational experience that allows you to live as God desires, that allows you to actually know God more and more and actually then begin to desire to be near him more and more. And the second modifier or attitude that characterizes prayer is thankfulness. Prayer should be filled with gratitude. True evidence that grace has visited your heart, that you actually know what it is and what it's like to be forgiven of sin that you are dead to the distractions of the world and alive to the mission of Jesus. And all that he has in store and all that he's doing is that you are irreducibly grateful. Like bad news can come. Uh, diagnoses, loss of jobs, all kinds of environmental things can shift, but you are irreducibly grateful. And then Paul finally says, with reference to himself and to others engaged, that are engaged in ministry, pray that God, so prayer is about asking God to come in. Prayer is about not our own efforts, but saying everything is done um, as, we, as we align ourselves with God's will. So pray that God will open doors. Prayer should not merely be about your own personal growth and development, but it should also be shaped by the same concerns that Jesus has for people to hear the gospel, for the opportunity to share the love of God with people that they might find that in Christ. No, Paul does not say anywhere uh, to change his circumstances, to make it easier, but rather that in these circumstances and all of this stuff that God would begin to open doors, that they would have an opportunity, that opportunity would come. So prayer is aligning yourself with what God is doing in the world. We are to be devoted to prayer, both personally and in personal response to the gospel uh, and, and, and how that um, operates in us to maintain a Christian life, to enjoy that Christian life. And, and prayer flows out uh, of a desire to see that multiplied in other people. And it also flows out of an int intimacy with God and his heart for the world. Now, 
I'm not telling you anything new. I don't think you learned anything new, really, when you read this uh, opening line. I don't think we've added too much to the, the usual conversation around prayer. Paul's just running back over things. He's reminding them. They would know about prayer. He's reminding us of the active agency of the Christian life. We pray. We pray because we delight in God. We pray because that's how the Holy Spirit gets at us. We pray because we want to join in with what God is doing in the world. We talk to God and we say things like in Jesus' name. You would have heard it every prayer that's been up here, which is not a mantra. It's not a magic spell on the end of a prayer. It's an identity identity statement. Jesus has shaped us for prayer. We come in his name to the Father. We pray to God because of the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus in our lives. He has made us God's beloved children. It's in his name that we approach God. And Paul picks up him that we approach God. And Paul picks up this fulfilled Old Testament promise in 2 Corinthians 6 where he says, I will be a father to you. This is God speaking to his people. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And John, who is one of Jesus' closest friends, writes, How great is the love of the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that's what we are. So go ask God for that glass of water, for that thing that you tremble about, approaching him about. The question is then, why what question is what Paul what why is what Paul describes here? this so difficult why is it that prayer is often the first thing that we let slip and the last thing that we take up well i think there's a few reasons for that i'm just going to run through a couple of them and then i think there's a few tools that we can grab that can can help us be devoted to prayer you will notice that paul doesn't actually lay any rules down in here there's no rules around prayer you don't have to face a certain way you don't have to dress a certain way you don't have to say certain words Rituals. You just simply need to continue this conversation, this relationship that God has started with you. So relational tools, not, not rules here when it comes to prayer. And firstly, I think one of the main hindrances uh, to prayer, and perhaps I'm just referencing it in my own life, but you know what, maybe there's some of you out there that are like this, is our poor understanding of God's affection for us, that God desires, actually desires to hear from us. We don't drink Uh, fully into our souls that there is a gladness in the heart of God for us that he delights in us that he wants to hear from us we find this position of God uh, hard to believe because we still view ourselves as shaped by sin and not Jesus the gospel is that sin has been dealt with that's going to be next next weekend Easter you are forgiven which means God no longer views you that way moves towards you on that basis Yes, we still do dumb stuff. Yes, you still sin, but God does not approach you on that basis. Jesus has changed that. He approaches you now with affection. But even before Jesus turned up and did all this for us, we still have Old Testament language that lets us know that God delights in his people. He is a loving father. In Zephaniah 3.17, yep, love a little kind of, you know, abstract scripture, scripture reference kind of makes you people think that I know the whole Bible. But this, this reference in Zephaniah is on the other side of the deliverance of God's people, his redemptive actions towards rebellious people. Here's what he says. The Lord your God is in your midst. So think us, think here right now. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one who will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. That's what Paul writes about in Romans 2, right? He will exult over you with loud singing. God rejoices over his people. Christians, with gladness, he sings over you, lifts you up to make much of you. And we like to keep a bit of a lid on this kind of language because we don't want people thinking that God's not concerned about sin. That doesn't bother him. He is. But that concern is not to crush you. It's to bring you to a space where you fully understand and delight in the fact that he delights in you. You will pray when you know God actually delights in you, regardless of your imperfect abilities to get there. 
Like he's not going to slap you in the face when you turn up on the stage to talk to him. That isn't happening. Another hindrance that is that we can have is our own parents, our own family of origin. And these kind of things, they all feed and weave into each other, right? Some of us grew up without fathers that delighted in us or delighted in their kids. So our image, our emotional response of what a father is like is, is quite negative in general terms. Or, or even it's kind of like irrelevant because, you know, our dad just simply didn't turn up, was absent, wasn't there. We, we, there's neglect, there's abandonment. So a father who sings over us takes a fair bit of adjustment, takes a fair bit of coming to terms with. But even the best parents have limits. Even the best dad on the planet has a limit. Limits to patience, limits to resources, limits to time. At some point, your nagging, your failures, your, your messiness is going to be met with a, hey, enough, you know, stop, shut up, you're driving me crazy, that kind of thing. Can't you just go and be like this? Or can't you just go and do that? And all of a sudden, even the best dad, we find our place of approval. We find our standards that we need to meet. And if you don't do what they want, leave them alone. And, and things, well, if you do do what they want, you do leave them alone and, and the things are going to go well. But if you don't, trouble. And now that might be a 30 second fuse in some dads. And there might be a 30 week fuse in some, but there's a limit. But the Bible lets us know that God wants us to bother him, constantly bother him. He doesn't have a fuse in that space. He has no limits on his times, no limits on his resources, his riches, his wisdom, his love. He is never distracted. He's never like, oh man, what? In Isaiah 65, 24, we read this. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. God is not absent. He is attentive when we approach him. It's probably what Jesus had in mind when he said in Matthew 6, 8, don't be like the Gentiles who think they've got to impress God when they've got to be heard, loud noises, do all this stuff, activities, tugging on his coattails. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. And we get the Lord's Prayer, right? So God is already intimately aware of your life. It's no surprise to him. All he's doing is waiting for you to bring him in, to come to him, to nag him, to depend on him, to have your life, life shaped by him in prayer. Now, this, this next one was great. This, uh, Matt Chandler brought this to my attention the way it is here. In Isaiah 62, 6 to 7, it says, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, you, you watchmen, give yourselves no rest, like don't stop. And give him, God, no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. God wants us to bother him. He wants us to seek him to the point here that he appoints people to annoy him endlessly, ceaselessly, without rest. These people have one job, to remind God day and night of his promises, his faithfulness, his goodness, his plan of salvation, to bring people to a, pray, a place where they, they understand what it is to have God sing over them. There are no limits here. There is no fuse. Just God saying, come, 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 bother me. I think this is what Jesus had in mind when he spoke about the persistent widow seeking justice in Luke 18. Luke 18, imagine if we were at Luke 18. Oh, that's like 2038, I think. She just went to the judge and she kept hammering away until she got what she needed. And then Jesus says, now if a shady judge can respond like that, then how much more God, your father, who is perfectly good, endless in resources, has no limits and no fuse. How much more God? We need to know that there is a gladness in the heart of God. We need to know that God is always attentive, always waiting, always willing to hear from us in prayer, wants to be bothered by us. Another hindrance which probably sh shapes, uh, is probably shaped, well, probably shapes the first one in a way, is that unconfessed sin, which is a failure to live in the gospel. We don't pray because we don't keep short accounts with God. 
which is probably because we don't understand that he delights in us. We feel we, cannot, we can only approach God when we're good. It's our morality that allows for prayer, right? And the gospel says, though, that read through Romans, Romans 5, Romans 6, it is while you were sinners that God saved you. You didn't do anything. You didn't make yourself good. You didn't tidy yourself up. You didn't do a thousand spiritual push-ups. And God went, okay, yeah, mm, die for you. God loved you while you were messed up, junked up. Prayer is not about your goodness. It's about God's. It's not about your power. It's about God's power. Prayer, we pray when we know that God's grace is greater than our sin. It's not about avoiding your sin. It's not about thinking it's cheap. It's got no place. It's about actually bringing it there and and acknowledging it and saying, yeah, this is where I put this first and you second. Sorry about that. Let's go. People who get this run toward God in prayer, not from him, when they come to their senses about sin. Now you hear me quote Timothy Keller all the time in this. You are far more wicked than you ever dare admit. Like You are bad. And if the deepness of our souls and some of our thoughts could be put out there, we just, we just want to riot, run and hide in shame. But at the same time, we are far more loved than we ever dare dream. That's what it's met with when we go to the Father. That's the gospel. And when we get that, we run toward God in prayer, not away from him in shame, to work it off over time, to become moral, to think you'll forget about it. That's already been done. That's next weekend. Another hindrance to prayer can be our pride. We literally think we control things or we want control of things because we don't trust that God delights in us. We say God is sovereign and sufficient and good, but then we get doing things. Once the whips get cracking, we get busier. Not many of us are like Martin Luther who wakes up and says, I have so much to do, I will spend three hours in prayer. We want control and prayer is fundamentally an exercise in recognizing the sovereignty of God, the complete sufficiency of God and our complete helplessness. We go to God in need. We go to God saying, Jesus is Lord, not Mason. God is not lacking. He is, not, he is in need of nothing. He is abundantly wealthy and he can give without any concern. And we are in need of all of it. Only when we can say that Jesus is Lord do we really start to pray. Another hindrance that we can have is our lack of appreciation of the spiritual battle that we are in and you know, to recognize that there is literally an organized system of rebellion out there. You read through the Gospel of John, that's what it is. Out there against God and his people. It has no mercy. We read about that in Ephesians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Peter, James, the whole Gospel of John's about it. It's a sermon in itself and it needs its own day. But if we understood just how much the devil wants to tear you apart, to destroy marriage and marriages, families and faith, I think we would pray more. That's coming attractions. Okay, we recognize some of the hindrances and the antidote to them all really is a better recognition of, of God's love for us, that he delights in us. So some practical helps. How to be devoted to prayer. What are some handles that we can grab? And being a Baptist, three Ps, okay? Because that's how Baptist brains work. Prayer needs a plan. Look, no rocket science here, okay? It needs a plan, it needs a place, and it needs particulars. So these are relational tools, not rules. We need to plan to pray, it doesn't, we don't drift towards prayer. We must plan to do it. And it's not so much that we don't want to pray, it's that we don't actually plan to pray. We need to schedule prayer into our day. When we're going to do it, where we're going to do it, how long, what, what are we going to need when we get there? We're going to need a, a, a Bible. Um, you may want to have a journal, like $2 from Woolworths, okay, or... Or go and see, Claire, she'll hit you up with a nice one from Kurong. All good. You know, I, I just take a coffee mug with some of my, you know, uh, activities, my, my, my Genesis project that I'm working on. And that just reminds me of what God's got me doing in the world. That we need to plan to pray. Pans, procedures. 
So it's not just prayer where we're just responding to situations. This is a dedicated time, a relational rhythm with God, and you need to plan it. If you don't do it, it won't just, it's not going to just magically happen. You'll get to the end of the day and go, oh, it didn't happen again. We all know that the opposite of planning is not a wonderful flow of deep, spontaneous experience of prayer. The opposite of planning is the same old rut, the same old frustration, a feeling of dissatisfaction. So, so plan. Plan to pray. How simple is that? Is that hard work? No, it's not. Book it into your day. But make also, this is the thing, make it sustainable, make it achievable. Like if, if at the moment you don't pray much, if you think, right, tomorrow morning, I'm getting up at four o'clock, okay? I'm going to read my Bible for six and a half hours, and then I'm going to pray for the next 10, and then I'm going to bed. That's not happening. Make it sustainable. Make it achievable. Start with 10 minutes. Find a place. That's the second thing, place. A place that actually works. A place where you're not distracted um, from, from the external, like it's easy, it's kind of easy for me. I come in here and it's a big building, 600 square feet, no one. I can pray over there, and over there, and over there. No one bothers me, not much. But, but you've got to find a place that works where you're not distracted. And you're like, I've got six kids. They're on rotation. Maybe pray in the toilet. I don't know. Find a place, whether that's walking the dog of an evening it's hard to journal on that when you're doing that. Or maybe it's in the car when, you, when you're driving to work. Set, set an alarm on your phone, but find a place that's going to work. If you're a night person, you know, 15 minutes before you go to bed, that's your place. If you're a morning person, just set the alarm 15 minutes earlier. Up you get, find that place. Could be down the beach. Like, down the beach is great. I've just written it that. A place where you can be present, uh, free from distractions, if you're like me, the biggest distraction that I have is my own mind. It's just full of noise. It's just full of stuff. So um, w- what I do is in, in the sense of place is before I start praying, because I'll get praying and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, I'll start praying about something and all of a sudden I'm having a conversation with myself about that. I'm arguing with myself about that, how I can solve it, what's gone, why that person was wrong. I'm going to punch him in the throat for that the next time I see him. Hang on a minute, I'm not talking to God anymore. Yeah? My own mind is a distraction. So like I go, okay, I'm going to read through Job 38 to 40. Just going to fuel my mind with the greatness and the goodness of God. I'm going to read through Isaiah 40. They're my like go-to passages. And, I, and in that place, I get rid of the distractions of my own mind by reading Scripture, Psalms, whatever. But, but you need to be undistracted, and that helps. Otherwise, you just find that it's... It's, it's hard work. And then particulars, and that's kind of a particular, but here we go. What, people go, well, what am I going to say? If you want me to pray for 10 minutes, what am I going to say? Are you kidding me? Um, how do we do that? Well, the Lord's Prayer that you read there in Matthew 6 gives you some categories. It's not a mantra. It's actually categories of how to pray. It's not to be recited just like, oh, let's recite this. We're done. No, it's like the greatness of God. Let's start with the greatness of God. Let's read Job. 38 to 40, the greatness of God, hallowed be your name. And then, then the will of God, like how do I bring myself into the will of God? Look, God, what are you doing in the world? What are you doing in me? This kind of stuff. The goodness and provision of God and the power of God. This is why Jesus gave it to us. It's not a mantra. It's a map. It's, 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 it's themes on how to pray. But you can work out categories for yourself. And often what I think is good to start close and then move out. Spouse. Family, neighbors, church, community, country, world. Like, what do you know about these things? What do you know about your wife? If you don't know something about your wife, pray about that. Spouse, family, neighbors, church, community, country, world. Like, start small, get bigger. And that's where a journal comes in helpful. Like a journal is just a, a log book of a prayer life where you write things down. So, so if, you, if you think, oh man, I can't, oh, what did I pray last time? Like this stuff is not going to magically drop into your head when you get there. You need to plan, you need to prepare, and you need the particulars in place. Pretty simple stuff. No, no, nothing crazy there really, is it? Oh, yeah. Prayer is God saying, join me in what I'm doing th- uh, through you. Uh, through what I'm doing in Christ in the world, through you personally here 
in this church. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful. Like, let it shape your life and be thankful with gratitude and then joining God in his mission. Let's pray right now. Lord, we thank you for this book of Colossians that you have that we've been going through here at Freeway and we're grateful for how um, the picture of your son, his supremacy and his sufficiency uh, in the universe and then in our lives to recreate us, to to pull us out of sin and and bring us into your new kingdom, that we would be dead to that and alive to your world and then then to see how your promises come alive in us as as we live that out now. Lord, the active agency in all of that as your word takes hold in our lives as your, is that we would stir it with prayer, that the Holy Spirit would come and, and, and stir in our lives what it is to live this life. And our prayer is that, that we would just do these simple little things like just we would plan prayer into our lives. We could find an, a place for prayer, somewhere where we know where we can be present with you and we know that you are present with us and, and that we would be, be diligent in, in, in the particulars of prayer, the content. You've given us your word. We could just pray your word back to you. And as we do, we'll find that we're praying for people, we're praying for mission, we're praying for all kinds of things. It's all there. Bless us, Lord. Delight in us. Would we know what it is to be delighted in by the God of the universe? That's our prayer. Amen.